Get it going. All right. So uh, tonight we're going to go ahead and finish up chapter, I think, or unit 15, if I'm correct. Yes. Okay. We're going to finish up unit 15. Uh, we're going to, like I said, pick up at 80. We have 125 slides, so we have 45 slides to cover. So we're going to barrel through this and get this done tonight. Uh, so we talked about Dodd-Frank, and we also talked about Regulation Z and the Truth in Lending Act. Now remember, these require the informed use of credit, okay? Uh, if you're going to use credit in this particular situation, understand that they have to meet certain rules. Like we talked about last night, Ms. Eugene, uh, you can't go over and say to one individual, this, is, this has to be your credit score, but you, I, I make an exception, okay? You have to make everything fair across the board to everybody. If you say you can get a, a loan at 2% interest, if you have a 750 credit score, it doesn't matter who walks in the door, if they have a 750 credit score, you gotta give them a 2% loan, period. Okay, no questions asked. So again, Regulation Z kind of breaks down the truth and what actually the costs are, what the requirements are, so it doesn't allow you, Mr. Eugene, to pull on shady stuff, okay? Again, the truth in lending disclosure, that basically breaks down, like we said, the financing charges and the APR. Uh, go ahead and hit the next one for me. Uh, the next one, of course, is that in the Regulation Z dealing with the truth in lending, there is a three-day right of rescission. Okay, uh, so if, for example, like Mr. Eugene, you just happen to do this today. Uh, you dealt with the refinancing. So uh, since you refinanced, you have a three-day right of rescission. So you have three days that you can say, you know what, actually, I don't want to proceed with this, and I want to back out. Okay, uh, so in that situation is, it does apply if you're dealing with refinancing, a second lien, or a home equity loan. Now. A three-day rescission does not apply if you're going to get a residential mortgage, okay? Uh, so if, for example, Travis, could you just imagine if you were representing Miss Leela, for example, and she's going to a closing, she's buying a house, and she sits down, she signs the paperwork and everything, and they say, well, okay, well, congratulations, Miss Leela, and four days, you'll get your keys. Oh, and by the way, Travis, four days, you'll get your commission check. How, how do you like that? I like it. Why don't you like that? Because that's that's too long. Too long, right? You want your money and now, it. right? It's my money and I need it now. That's right. It's your money and you need it now. So in that situation is, while we don't really deal with this real estate agents, we don't deal with this part down here. We don't really deal with the refinancing, the second liens, or any of that. What we do deal with is the first mortgage loans. Okay. But when we go to a closing, Travis, when you go to the closing with Miss Lila, once she signs and the other party signs, what happens? When do you get your money? Yeah. Within a few hours. Within a few hours. Yeah. Pretty quick. Okay. So in those situations is, is it does allow for that. Now, further regulation Z deals with certain type of advertising. Now, what was happening is, and as we all know this, Advertising can end up, it can be very, uh, no, no, we got audio still. I just got something that I had to, to read real quick. Just kind of like, did it freeze? <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't freeze. We didn't freeze. The, uh, it just shows you how real estate, I had given somebody, one of my agents, a lead, and uh, this lead went over and basically uh, told, <laughs> I, I gave her a lead and we tried to stay on top of her, and this agent gave all this information, went showed her property, and then they told her after she liked the property, oh, thank you for your time, I've got another agent. So she she just messaged me and, and told me that. That's so, Oh, that's sad. Oh, yeah. But that happens in real estate. That happens in real estate. Uh, but again, coming back here, like we were saying, is uh, Regulation Z, again, deals with the truth in lending, and it's basically the advertising trigger terms, okay? Uh, there, what happened is a lot of lenders basically are the same type of method. They use the same way. For example, they're sales. That's what they do. 
for them to get paid, they have to do what? SNAP gets you to use their mortgage company or their loan company. So they used to put in a lot of different types of terms or trigger terms. So they may say, you know, Mr. Eugene, you come with us and we'll give you 0% down payment. Okay. But what you don't know is, is that we're taking that down payment that you had to pay and we put it in the back of your loan. Oh, yeah. You'll okay. Get, get it. Yeah, you're going to get it, get it somehow. Oh, yeah. So in that situation is, is when you're going through these things, you have to make certain that as you're doing this, that you understand these different trigger terms. There's certain things that if you're going to use things like down payment, number of payments, monthly payment, dollar amount and finance charge, all of these have to meet certain regulations. Now, general terms do not trigger full disclosure though. Okay. Now triggers, what does trigger full disclosure is if you're going to use these three down here at the bottom, the amount or percentage of down payment, the terms of repayment over the term of the loan or the annual percentage rate and any increases. So if you're trying to entice somebody, we're saying 0% APR. I remember prior to this whole, this whole situation, you used to get so many things in the mail. My dad especially get tons of things in the mail. You know, get this deal at 0% down payment. Okay. But then the bottom would be about that thick of fine print to probably like six font point explaining for you to get this, you have to have an 850 credit score, blah, 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 you know, big old mess. Okay. Um, there also was the Mortgage Disclosure Improvement Act, the MDIA, and it states that the good faith estimate, and y'all need to know that term, GFE, good faith estimate, has to be given three days of the application. So when you go, if your client applies for a mortgage, they, the lender, has to provide to that borrower within three days a good faith estimate of what the costs are going to be, okay, within three days. Now, another thing is, is that there is a seven-day waiting period to close after the, the GFE has been given. So Mr. Stephan goes out and he gets, say, for example, Mr. Garrett, okay, and in this particular situation, he gets Mr. Garrett and uh, he goes over and he ends up, Garrett gets approved within three days and Garrett was supposed the fifth day. Well, can he do that? No, because there's a seven day waiting period to close after the GFE's gift. So you can't close, that's why I tell people all the time, you can't close a loan, but for what? Within 10 days at the minimum, okay? Now, that's if we didn't have to do appraisals and all that. Okay, but in loans, do you have to do appraisal stuff? Yeah, you do. Okay, so in this situation is, is there is a seven day waiting period to close, which means a loan cannot be done, but you still gotta do inspections and you gotta do appraisals and all this stuff. So in that situation, guess what? It takes on average about 30 days to close a loan. Okay, approximately 30 days. Now lenders cannot collect fees prior to issuing a GFE. They cannot collect any money until after they've ended up issued that GFE. Now the appraisal to the buyer must be given to them, and this is what sucks in real estate, is that they do not have to have the appraisal completed and given to the buyer except three days prior to closing. And I've had that situation before. One of my, ten, or not my, one of my um, clients ended up, they decided to pick their own lender. And their own lender ended up, went over and just him hauled around for three weeks and didn't order it until three weeks into the contract. Okay, so about 20 days went by and then he decided, oh, I need to order the appraisal. We didn't get the appraisal until three days before closing. And sure enough, what do you think happened, Travis, when the appraisal come in? Did it come in perfect? No. What did it do? Too low. Yeah. Came in too low. So now what do I have to do as a real estate agent? I got to call the other agent and do what? You got to do a lot of work. What you gotta do. I got to negotiate. And guess what? That three days is within that also three day closing disclosure deadline, which means if I'm going to make this deal close on time, I have to have it all done today. Yeah. Today. Okay. 
And normally two days by what time? By five o'clock. Before five o'clock. Okay? Because title and all closes before five o'clock. So in those situations is, that's why I come back to tell you as real estate agents, you must, must, must stay on top of everybody. You may think, I got everything good on my side. I'm good. I'm golden. I just sell so long. I just, I just keep on sailing, right? But in reality, can you do that, Stephanie? No, you can't. Because when you sell along, guess what happens? The other people are doing what? They think they can coast along too. <clears throat> I one time I had to call a lender and say, hey, where are we at in the process? I haven't had anything or heard anything about a, uh, a closing or anything. What are you talking about? Yeah, we sent over the paper. I never got it. Check your spam folder. And start looking. Oh, yeah, you did send it to me two weeks ago. You know what they tell me? Well, just get an amendment. Do you think you're going to get an amendment signed in a hot market? No. no. Lost that deal. So in that situation is, understand that there are situations. But again, appraisal must be given to the buyer within three days. There is a three-day additional wait if there has to be a new truth in lending. So if truth in lending has to be reissued, everything has to wait for three more days. Okay. Risky loan features also have to be disclosed. If there's any risky loans, they have to disclose them. Now, the truth in lending requirements for high-cost loans under the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act uh, basically state... And they qualify as what's called a full and not teaser interest rate. Okay, uh, The disclosures are required again on three days before closing or the account opening on a high cost mortgage. There is no prepayment penalties or financing of points and fees. And they also have to verify the income, assets, and expenses. These are going to be those ones that you're dealing with a much more larger type loan. Okay, I want to tell you something. If you're going to deal with a purchase that is a high loan income, so say, for example, I'm going to use Jason for a minute, Travis here. Say that your client, and Jason, went to buy a $4 million house. That'd be nice. Okay? Be great for you, right? Be great. Nice big paycheck. But in the situation is, is if he buys that, the type of loan he has to get is not going to be an everyday type of loan. It's going to be a higher income type loan. So there requires a lot more disclosures. And that's why I tell a lot of times, you wanna to try to put 30 just because you're competitive, but most likely at that type of level, it's gonna push out to about 45 days because you're gonna have a lot more paperwork involved, okay? Now I have closed a one and a half million dollar deal within 40 days, uh, and that's from listing it to closing. So from the day I listed it to closing, I had it done within about 45 days. Um, but that was me literally running back and forth oh, yeah. all over the place, okay? And me doing all the stuff. So uh, it depends. You know, if you have one client, you can designate and put all your attention to that one person. But what happens, Stephanie, if you have seven uh, $250,000 houses? Can you be running around all day? Not really, okay? It kind of puts you in a bind in that. And that's why as you keep growing your business, the goal is, is that you either put a limit on how many you can get or what do you start doing? Uh, it Refer or what else could you do? Do what Travis is doing. What's Travis doing? Start a team. Start his own team. And then what do you do? Hey, you know, Travis, say that Travis got a lot of business. He may say, Stephan, you don't have anything come work with me and my team. We work the deals together. I deal with sellers, you work with buyers, and we work it that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> in that situation is, that's something that you do need to be aware of, okay? Now, the truth and lending requirements for high cost loans under this uh, particular act, basically is it discloses, they must disclose the right of recession, uh, when the loan modification increases the loan balance, uh, the balloon payments are generally going to be banned just because the fact is, is what? It's a high cost loan. Okay. And with a high cost loan, what ends up happening? Well, it, uh, there's a lot more things that are involved in it. Okay. 
So again, when we do go through these different situations, it's going to be very imperative that you understand balloon payments are not going to be banned or are not going to be allowed because if you have a $4 million note, it's kind of impossible for one person to pay $4 million in their last payment. Again, there are late fees, must not be more than 4% of any past due payment. Uh, there can be no advice to the borrower to default on the debt. And the home ownership counseling must be given before the high cost mortgage. Yes, what does end up happening is, is if you are one of those that's in a high cost mortgage, you get to do home, home ownership counseling, okay? And they teach you about debts and ratios and all of that type of stuff. There are certain penalties that are also assessed uh, that can be given in certain situations. Uh, under this, there was a transference in regards to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You will need to be aware of the CFPB, okay? CFPB is the one that basically now controls a lot, especially HUD. Uh, they deal with a lot of things, uh, but it's basically, it has, the mortgage disclosures have ended up being combined uh, with the truth in lending and the GFE. And so the truth in lending statement, the GFE, used to be two separate forms. Now they are one form, and that's called the loan estimate, okay? The closing disclosure has now been replaced. The HUD, we used to call it the HUD. The HUD's no longer used unless it's a cash transaction. So now if you're doing a commission, I mean a, a loan, you're going to deal with the loan estimate and the closing disclosure. If you're dealing with the cash, you're not really going to have these disclosures at the top because there's no disclosures to be given. It's a cash transaction. So the only form you're really going to see is the HUD. Okay. So very rarely do you actually see the, or the HUD unless it's a full cash transaction. Now, the ability re to repay rule in Regulation Z, there are eight factors that lenders must consider that are going to be regarding the borrower. Okay. Uh, the first one is the income and assets. Okay. They're going to look and see that, you know, Mr. Aiden, can you afford this house? What's your income? And one thing that they're also going to do is, is they're going to go in and they're not just going to say, you know, Mr. Aiden, how much do you make? And Mr. Aiden just fills out a form. All right. They're actually in this particular situation, they're going to go in and they're going to write out. Okay. They're going to go in and they're going to write out all of the stuff. Um, and so they're going to check what he says. So if he writes down that he makes $5,000 a month, well, guess what happens? They're going to call to verify that he makes $5,000 a month. Okay. Um, so they're going to look at all these assets. They're also going to check your current employment status. They're going to look at the monthly mortgage payments, the monthly payments for other loans on property. And they're also going to look at the mortgage related, mortgage related obligations, such as taxes, insurance, HOA fees. Okay. They take into account a lot of different factors. They'll also look at any other debt obligations, as well as your monthly debt to income ratio and your credit history. Now, here's the most interesting thing. They, in certain things, when they look at your stuff, there are certain items that you actually can be indebted to that lenders are allowed if, at their discretion that they don't have to calculate. So, Mr. Eugene, you may have five or say fifty thousand dollars in credit card debt. If that bank's rules allow them to discard certain things, they could just kind of not even put that into calculations. But do you still owe that money? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that happens all the time. I'm just saying it depends on the type of loan and, and the regulation. There's many different factors. But there can be in certain things that there could be certain debts that they may not take into consideration that you still owe. Okay. Or... They may take into consideration, Mr. Eugene, the 50000 but guess what? They're only looking at it at the minimum payment. So they're like, well, he's got fifty grand, and you and you are paying, say, 4000 a month towards it, but they're over here calculating, yeah, about $150. Well, what's the thing? You're going to get more money that you can borrow, but in reality, can you continue to pay the 4000 if you just got a mortgage? No, so you're going to pay less, and that debt does what? It goes higher and higher and higher, 
because the fact is you're now paying less and less and less. Okay. There's also qualified mortgage standards in Regulation Z. Okay. There is no interest only negative amortization or balloons at all. They also verify income and assets. There is no no doc loans. Okay. Uh, so they're actually going to go in and double check. They are going to do a debt to income ratio, no more though than 43%. And they're going to have upfront points and fees, no, no more than 3% of the loan for 100,000 or more. The monthly payments are going to be based upon the highest payment and the documentation must be kept for three years, All right? Now, one of the biggest things that we have an issue with, and I like to spend a little time here on this, is just because I myself have dealt with this um, over time, is I personally have had my identity stolen. And my dad all remembers that back when I was in college and all, my identity was stolen. And um, I wish that this act had been in play, and I've known about all of this back in the day, but there was the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act of 2003. And uh, it basically, it allows every individual, every individual that's in America, you can get your three credits reports for free, no charge to you, by visiting annualcreditreport.com, okay? You go to annualcreditreport.com, you fill in your information, you verify your stuff, you can get your three credit reports. This is yearly. Every single year, you can go on here and you can pull your stuff. I do it every year. I go in, I check. I make certain that nobody has took my name or took my stuff, and uh, and I dispute anything that's not right. Now, if while you're doing this, say that Miss Leela goes and she pulls this and she notices something, uh, then in a situation is Leela knows notices say for example that uh, hey there's a loan on here that isn't mine. Okay, she can dispute it, and then what ends up happening is. They will put a fraud detection and alert, which means she can't apply for a loan on anything else for a certain time period. I think it's 60 days. But what they end up doing is, is they will block her account and no credit will be given to her at all for 60 days. And if somebody does try to apply, they know now that, hey, this is a scam. So we're going to go over here and we're going to end up, we need to resolve this and, and catch this person. Okay. Um, there's also a record dispute uh, disposal rule that has to be kept, and there's also the red flag, which is the fraud alert plans. And all of these basically help you in regards to managing your personal uh, privacy. Okay, so in that particular situation, one of the key things that I tell people all the time is, is you want to make certain by all means that you're keeping up to date on all of this stuff. Okay. Um, there also is the security freeze law, okay? And this is where it basically, like I was saying earlier, it's you contact each of your credit reporting agencies. You can either do this in writing or online uh, and lift for a new credit. Any of these things allows you to freeze your credit. You can get on there, you can freeze your stuff. It's kind of like your credit cards. Nowadays, credit cards, I can get on here and I can get on my phone and I can go over here and I can click lock and my credit card is locked. So if Travis happens to steal my card and go try to buy some stuff, it's going to deny it. It's going to deny, deny, okay? And some of them will even tell you where it was used at. They'll say that Travis, well, they won't say Travis, but they'll say your card was used at the gas station, the Exxon gas station on such and such street. In that situation, you know that your, your card's being used. Same thing with the security freeze. It will freeze your credit where nobody can get anything. However, if you put a security freeze on, and then Mr. Eugene, you decide to freeze my credit because I don't want nobody using my stuff, and then you decide, well, I'm gonna go apply for a mortgage. Good luck, because you can't easily get this removed. Once you enact it, it stays in play for the time that it has to stay. You cannot remove it, okay? Now, under the uh, Patriot Act, they now require that if there's any type of lending, we actually have to verify the customer's ID. We actually have to make certain that the person borrowing the money is actually that person. That's why when you go nowadays, I know when my dad, when you were younger, when we were younger, dad could go down to the bank and he would just make a phone call. Hey, I need to borrow some money. Okay, we'll just drive down, sign some paperwork, 
He'd go down, he'd sign paper, they would give him the money, he went on and found his way. Okay? Never had to give his ID. They just knew who he was. Nowadays, if you want to borrow money, what happens? They gotta know everything about you. They gotta know about you and your firstborn child and which blood type and, and everything. Okay? They wanna know it all. So in that situation is is that you now have to verify it all. Okay? Now, predatory lending though, you gotta be careful. And unfortunately, it's really, really, really sad, guys and gals. People that are in the minority are the ones that often are subjected to this. Okay, I had a good friend of mine went to high school. Great guy. <clears throat> Great guy. Uh, you probably know his know uh, the one that used to play drums in, in high school. Uh, he ended up good guy, very good guy and all. Uh, he's been trying to get a mortgage. Now he makes about seventy thousand a year. He's gone down to his local bank, and his local bank just tells him, "Yeah, you're not going to get approved. You can't meet our requirements." He's got pretty good credit and all, but they won't approve him. So he constantly is looking online trying to find a place to get a mortgage. Okay, I've even tried to help him, and he doesn't have bad credit either. But what happens is a lot of people that are in the minority end up, they get taken advantage of by this predatory lending, okay? And it's basically, it's individual, say for example, Mr. Eugene, that uh, Stefan, say Stefan's in a minority group, and Stefan comes to you, and you're a, what they quote unquote call a, a investor friendly person, or you, you do private loans, okay? So you go over there and Stefan comes to you and he says, you know, hey, Mr. Nobles, I, uh, I've gone to Bank of America, I've gone here, I've gone there, blah, blah. all of them turn me down. And, and he says, well, Stefan, I'll be more than glad to lend you some money. I'll be more than glad. I'll give you, you know, how much you want for your house? Well, 200000 Okay, well, I'll buy the house, and you'll buy it for him, and, and then you'll do a note with him for a deed. He can purchase the house from you, and you're only charging him 12% interest. Does that sound good, Stefan? For you, but here's the thing is, he makes the same, we'll say he makes the same amount of money as I do. There's a million there. He said, yeah, right. So in that situation, what ends up happening here? Well, the thing is, is that Stefan's going to get into a deed, a contract for deed, and the problem with that is, is guess what, Stefan? It's like you're paying lease or rent to Mr. Eugene. And eventually, guess what? Mr. Eugene starts making it more difficult on you to pay rent, and then eventually, what do you do, Mr. Eugene? Uh, well, I got all his money. Get out! Get out of my house! <clears throat> out, sorry. And he's gonna go, and now he's gonna go do it to Travis. Yeah, ain't that isn't that nice of him? Yeah. <laughs> so in that situation oh, is is that it's where they knowingly lend more money than a borrower can afford. Mr. Eugene goes over. He purposely puts Stefan and Travis into a note that he knows they can't afford it. He's setting them up for failure, okay? He's also maybe charging higher interest rates based on something other than their credit history. Mr. Eugene knows of Stefan's family, so he's like, ha, oh, I know what I'm gonna do. They don't ever pay their dang gum bills anyway. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot that dad blasted thing up through the roof and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take advantage of it. I'll get all of his money out of it, okay? They charge fees or, for unnecessary or non-existent services. You may say, well, Stephen, I'll let you borrow our borrowed money, but there's, you know, I gotta draft this paper and I gotta do this. I got so for me just to give you, you know, a five thousand dollar loan, it's gonna cost you about five thousand just for all of our fees. That's what I'm gonna eat now too. So how you liking this, Stephen? Sound good? Oh, he loves it. Trust me, he does. So. Yeah. So, he loves it. Yeah, uh-huh. So what happens is, I'll sign for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, in this situation, is predatory lending. What happens? Predatory lending is not something that you want to get your client into. You don't want to get them involved in. Now, mortgage fraud. Does that sound familiar? Mortgage fraud is what we call the mis material. Very key material misstatement, misrepresentation, omission relating to a property or a mortgage. Okay? Mr. Grossman, 
What happened to you not too long ago, sir? Don't give the names or anything or the property address. Uh, but t come up here for a minute and just tell them for me. Tell them kind of what happened. Come on up here. Uh, a client of mine wanted to put a contract on a house, so we got a contract in for a certain amount. But it turns out the guy selling the house owed more than what we were under contract for and what he said he owed on it. He didn't even, he, either he knew that he was committing mortgage fraud or, I don't know, but he, he owed more money than he said he did. So it, it threw the whole um, transaction off. We lost it. Oh. So in that situation, what ended up happening was Stefan had gone through, had the whole process ready, was ready to close this thing, and guess what ends up happening? The guy owed over, was it fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars more? Fifteen thousand. Yeah. More than what it, they had. Well, was he not mis misrepresenting a material fact on a mortgage? No. Yeah. Mortgage fraud. Okay. And had we ended up had we gone through and done anything, we could have probably progressed with it, but ultimately, is that the real estate agent's problem? Technically, yeah, because as an agent, it's your duty to make certain that your seller knows the current information, okay? I tell people that all the time is, is that you go over here, when you do a listing, it's your duty to find out what is their last payment? What exactly do they owe? When you pay your payment, Mr. Eugene, for your mortgage, does it say, sir, on there, does it say exactly how much you owe once you make the payment? Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes, not all the time. But, uh, but if you sign in line, online, can you see how much you owe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a way for you to find out how much you owe. Okay. <clears throat> so it's imperative that you make certain that your client, that you're aware, because I'm going to tell you this. A lot of times, and this does happen. Travis, in your house, who handles mainly the money? You or your wife? My wife. Okay. Mr. Eugene, in your house, who handles the money? The boss. I mean, wife. Your wife. Okay. And, and Miss Leela, do you or you do you or your spouse, do y'all who handles it out of between y'all? We kind of split it. You split it. So in that situation is, as you can see, majority of it is who? Most of the time it's the female. Okay, most of the time. And it's in that situation is because of what? It's because of that situation is, is that the, the wife normally, first off, ladies are a lot better than men sometimes with numbers. Oh, yeah. So in that situation is, they can run it, they know it, they know everything. But if like in Stefan's situation, the person was getting divorced, well, the individual got divorced, the wife handled all the finances, she's gone, he knows nothing, and so he just thought, yeah, my house is worth bought and puts it on the market without even knowing what it was worth. Okay. So in that situation is you have to be very careful. Now, fraud for housing can be fraud by a borrower and it's giving false information to acquire or maintain home ownership. So this can happen. And guys and gals, you've got to be aware of this. Say, for example, Travis, that you want to buy a house. And your wife, she's been bugging you constantly. I want to buy, I want a home, I want a home, I want a home, I want a home. And you being well, the husband want to provide for her. Okay. So you said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to uh, Stefan. And I'm going to tell Stefan that I quote unquote work for Stefan. Okay. So Stefan's going to quote unquote hire me. And he's going to basically say that he's paying me. $250,000 a year. Okay. And so when Mr. Eugene, when I apply for a loan with Mr. Eugene, I'm going to put down Stefan Grossman as my, uh, my employer. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Stefan go over and write a letter to Mr. Eugene, verifying, quote unquote, verifying my employment. And, uh, and I'm going to go over there and I'm going to get that loan based off of $250,000. Okay. Well, Mr. Eugene, what happens? Mr. You got an application from Travis that says what? He's employed by who? Uh, by Stefan, right? 
And how much does he make? It says two hundred fifty thousand a year, but I'm gonna check that out. All right, so you call Stefan, and what does he tell you? He says fifty thousand a year. He he pays him two hundred fifty thousand a year. What business is this? Huh? Well, you you really can't dig that much into it. Oh, okay. So you're just gonna say, okay, well, he fill out the form. So you get it. You got a form that says, yeah, he's he's getting two hundred fifty. So are you going to approve it? Got approved. You're going to approve it. That's a lot of money here. Now what happens? Now Travis just went out and bought a house for two hundred fifty thousand, or I'll say a five hundred thousand dollar house because he's making two hundred fifty. And then what ends up happening? Travis, can you afford that house? No. So now what ends up happening is, as Travis ends up, he tries to go and he tries to fight it on technicalities to keep the house. But what actually happened? It's fraud. He's created fraud to maintain or acquire a home. There is also fraud for, for profit. This is a little bit different. So this one, the fraud for housing is he's actually trying to get the house. Okay. With a fraud for profit is it's the fraud by the industry or industry's insight. So it's equity skimming, property flipping, or loans for fictitious properties. This is where Travis knows. He's like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to go over and I'm going to buy a house with that two hundred fifty thousand or what five hundred thousand that Mr. Eugene's given me. So I'm going to buy this house. And what happened is, is this house, Mr. Eugene, Mr. Uh, Grossman and, and Mr. Travis went out and put a put a mailbox up and all, and they make it look like it's a house. But in reality, when you drive by, it looks like that's the property. But in reality, guess what happens? It's not even a house there. And in some situations, he may even say, get me involved in it as because you want an appraisal, Mr. Eugene. So I mean, you get me, he gets me involved and he says, hey, I'm an appraiser. And he says, hey, Justin, we got this little thing going here. We're going to go over and Stefan's going to act as my employer. I want you to be the appraiser on this house. And what we're going to do is we're all going to work this together. And you're going to go out there and you're going to appraise the house. And you're going to send it to Mr. Eugene. And he's going to think that it's a house there. And then we'll get it all done. And then when I get the cash, then I'm going to turn around and we're going to split. Then you're going to disappear. And then we'll disappear. Guess what? That's fraud for profit. Can't do that. You can't end up doing anything to that nature. It's against the law. You cannot do fraud for anything. That's why they made it very, very difficult for this fraud to happen anymore. Okay. There's also the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. You have to make certain by all means that you treat everybody the same. Everybody has to have the same opportunity to credit, no matter based upon their race, religion, creed, origin, any of that stuff. Okay. There also is the Community Reinvestment Act. There are certain community reinvestment programs that are out there that allow you to borrow money to revitalize neighborhoods. The, so, uh, the Texas Securities Act also comes into play. And the Real Estate Settlement Protection or Procedures Act, RESPA. RESPA basically states that we have to make certain that there is no illegal kickbacks. We do not want to have this happening. We don't want, say I'm the broker, Stefan is a home inspector, and Travis is a home appraiser. Okay. I tell Stefan, hey, I'll refer all of my business to you if you give me some money for all the ones that I give you. So every one you do, I get 50 bucks. And Travis, I'm going to refer all my business for appraisals to you, but I want you to give me 50 bucks. Okay? And we'll just keep it going. And if and if y'all refer me business, guess what happens? I give you 50 bucks. So we got this little, little thing here. Well, under the Real Estate for Settlement Procedures Act, you can't do that. And if you try, certain things can happen. You have to disclose it to all parties. Okay? So that basically breaks down in regards to the different types of legislation. Now what I want to focus on is on this matter right here. This is the mortgage law. And this deals with the title theory and the lien theory. Okay. This is talking about how the mortgage is going to be helped and okay? how the title is going to be helped. Now a title theory is basically the mortgagee is the lender. It's going to be the owner of that mortgage property. And under a title theory, the mortgage company 
holds title to the property. Now, Mr. Eugene, is that how it is in Texas for you? I mean, when you just refinance, does that mean that the bank now holds the ownership of your property? Does the bank own your property? No, sir. No. You do. Oh, I do. You do. They hold my, they hold my title. They, they have a, a lien on you, remember? You still have the you still have title. You right. own it. But guess what ends up happening? You're the owner. They just got a lien on it. Now, that's why we come here to lien theory. It's where the mortgagor, which is you, Mr. Nobles, is the owner of the mortgage property. But the lender, which is the mortgagee, merely holds a lien. And this is what we are here in Texas. So you technically own your property, but you've got a lien on that property. Does that make sense? Now, there are two ways in which they do uh, two primary documents that are utilized when dealing with mortgages. There is a promissory note, and this, like, for example, normally if my mother was here, I would end up, I'd ask her, what do you pay every month to, for your house, to live in your house? What do you pay for that, Mr. Nobles? If you want to live in your house, what do you have to pay each month? Well, it's not a mortgage. I pay on my lingo. pay a mortgage payment. you got to pay your mortgage, right? right? That's what everybody says. Is that true, Mr. Stahl? Do they pay their mortgage? No, what are they paying? They're paying their promissory <laughs> note. They're paying their <laughs> promissory note. When you make a payment, Mr. Eugene, you are paying a promissory note, not a, a mortgage. The mortgage is the document we file with the county that says that Travis owns interest into your property. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, another thing we use here in Texas is called the deed of trust, and it creates the actual link, and it is the security for a debt. Okay. Now, the promissory note is exactly what it sounds like. It's a promise. It's a promise to pay. And how many people are involved in a promissory note, Mr. Grossman? Uh, three. Two. Two. Who are those people, Travis? Who's involved in a promissory? Well, who's, who's taking the money first? Nope. Who's getting the money? Or what is the what's so, the formal name? It's a uh, buyer. Uh, <laughs> where is it? No, it's not on there. It's a borrower. Borrower. Yeah, borrower. Okay. The borrower, which is the buyer. Right. Okay. So if the borrower is paying is one of the parties, then who's the other party? So, the lender. Yeah. If the borrower is paying. They got to pay somebody, and who's that somebody? The lender. The lender. Okay. So the, it's a bilateral contract, and it deals with the borrower and the lender. Okay. Now it contains, of course, terms and conditions, and it also is a negotiable instrument. Guess what that means, Mr. Eugene? You can negotiate it. Okay. A lot of people don't think they can, but you can. And it is not recorded. That's what I like that look, Mr. Eugene. What? You mean it's not recorded? You go down there and try to pull your promissory note. Not there. It ain't gonna be there because it stipulates all the terms and everything about your loan. Do you want Travis to go down there and be able to pull that and look no. at that stuff? No. So in that situation, you don't want nobody knowing your personal information. So that's why we file the mortgage. Okay. And a mortgage is a charge for the use. Well, this is talking about interest. We see if it's no, it's not there. But the document that they follow is called your mortgage. And that is when you go down, if I actually wanted to see Miss Leela's uh, stuff, and I'm not going to do this, but I could if I wanted to, I could get on to Harris County, um, look at their court records. I could pull up Miss Leela's name, and I could go in and I could pull her title, and I could pull her lien. But I'm not going to see her promissory note. I'm just going to see that Miss Leela owes a certain bank or a person money and how much that money is. Okay. But guess what? Is that always going to be the exact purchase price that's on there? No. Because Miss Leela might have put 50000 or 50% down. And it may show that her house, she only paid 180 
but the house she's in is worth two million. Okay, it's not always you can't just look at that and assume that's what Miss Lula actually paid for, and you can't assume that what's on that note is what she still owes because it's at the time that she borrowed that money. Okay, so you can't always jump to those conclusions. Now, again, mortgage interest is where it's a charge for the use of money, and that's just the interest in all this. Interest total is what? It's, I'm charging you rent on my money. I gave Travis some money, I gave him a hundred bucks, and I say, when you give it back, you're gonna give me 105, okay? So in that particular situation is, I tell him, I say, you give me 105 back, that $5 is, I could have been using that hundred on something else, but that's what I'm charging him to borrow my money. That's interest. Again, mortgage interest is always paid in arrears. What's arrears mean? If you ever worked in uh, in court, especially in family court, you know what arrearages are. Or if you ever been had to pay child support, you know what it is. And it's basically back support. It's previous. Okay. So in that situation, they're normally paid in arrears, and it's at the end of the payment period. So May's payment includes the interest for April. Okay. So it's calculated based upon the principal times the rate times the time equals your interest. Now what's usury? Well, usury is where you're charging interest in excess of the maximum set by state law. Okay, so say for example that Mr. Eugene, you need to borrow some money. So you ask Travis, Travis, can I borrow $500,000? Travis like, yeah, that's pocket change to me. I, I don't mind. I'll, I'll write a check to you. But guess what, Mr. Eugene? He goes in, though, and he says, I charge you 25%. Ooh, so, and it's not per annum. It's per day. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. So in that situation is, is that not going in excess of the maximum set by law? Yeah. Hey, much. Okay. So usury laws protects the public from unscrupulous lenders, crooked lenders. Okay. 18% is normally the maximum. But if it's tied to an index, it can go up as the rate goes up. So if you're going to charge, if Travis wants to charge you 18%, he can. But if he wants to charge you 19%, it can't. He can charge up to 18, but 18 is the maximum. All right. Now, Travis, what if you charged, say you did do the 25%, okay, per day, not per annual. And then Mr. Eugene just don't pay you. And you take him to court and you say, your honor, Mr. Grossman, uh, Mr. Eugene owes me $2 million. Yes, it's been four days. Yeah. So he's going to say, where's my money? I don't even know how much. Yeah, it's a ton. But what ends up happening is Mr. Eugene goes over and he, he says what? Well, your honor, yeah, I did sign that. But what's he going to say? But, you, but your honor, Mr. Stahl is violating the usury law. Because what's happening? He's charging, he's charging me 25% okay. instead of 18%. And he's doing this per day, not per year. Like one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a day. It's a lot. Well, that's only for the first day. That's the first day. <laughs> it's going to go yeah. up from that. And it compounds. <laughs> so in that situation, is what's the judge going to say to him? No, they're going to tell Travis. Well, the maximum I can actually set, Travis, is eighteen percent. So year. anything per year. So anything over eighteen percent, he don't owe you. So even though you're in a contract with Mr. Nobles for this amount, I can't enforce that law because the law says I can't. So Travis, I got to recalculate everything at 18%. And at that point, Travis is going to get very upset. Okay. So again, that's why I get people that call me all the time and they'll say, hey, can I, if I want to lend some money to a friend, can, can I go over and lend them, you know, charge them 25%? No. Well, why not? And I tell them this. Well, you could if you want, but you ain't getting it unless they pay you. Because if they if they stop paying you and you sue, 
you got to sue, they can only sue up to that maximum. That's what the law says. Okay. Now, if it is tied to an index, remember we talked about this though, if it's in tied to an index, the rates increases if the index goes over 18%. So if the index is rate, guess what happens? It can go up, okay? A lot of times they can float between 18 and 24% on personal, family, household, and agricultural. So if this was a personal matter and it was attached to an index, it could go up, Mr. Eugene, to 24%, but can it go to 25? No. And it can, in some situations, float between 18 and 28% if it's a business, commercial, or an investment, okay? Now, what's so worried so about this whole prepayment penalty? What? We ain't nothing to worry about on this. We should just skip this, right, Mr. UJ? There's no big deal on this, right? We just go on and call it a day, right? Yep, sounds good to me. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> Under prepayment penalty, prepayment penalty basically states, and this is kind of where I've talked about it before in, in the finance course, prepayment penalty is like this. We've all been in college. We've all been there. We've been in school. And just imagine if your, your teacher comes up on day one, and I'm your English teacher, uh, Travis. I come up here on day one, and I say, all right, everybody, you are going to write four papers in this class, okay? And four papers is what you're going to write, and uh, that's going to be 25% of your grade for a total of each one, 25, that's a total of what? 100%, okay? So I come in and I tell that, and Travis, he loves, he loves to write. He loves to write. He, he enjoys it. So he goes over and he says, you know what? I'm going to write them all. <laughs> I'm going to write them all this weekend. I have no life. I'm just going to write papers. That's what I want to yeah. do, right? That's what I'm going to do. My so, favorite thing. Yeah, just so much, right? So Travis is like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to write all my papers. And you know what? I'm in such a good mood. I'm going to write a fifth one, too just because I want to, to show off to my professor. So Travis goes home and he writes all of his papers and comes in on Monday and he walks up to his professor. He comes up to me and he hands me his papers and he says, Professor Knowles, I wrote all my papers and I even threw in an extra one just because I wanted to. And I take them and I look at them and I tear them up, throw them in the garbage and say, you failed my class. And this reminds me back to when I was actually in your class. <laughs> <laughs> so in that situation, what happens? He just failed his class. Shouldn't have turned it in early, nerd. No. <laughs> <laughs> so in that situation is, guess what? That's what it's like with prepayment. You go over, Mr. Eugene, and you're thinking, you know what? I'm going to save up my money. I'm going to save up a bunch of money. I'm going to take work, odd jobs and all. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to save up, and I'm going to pay off my mortgage early. So Mr. Eugene's working all these crazy hours and he's trying to pay off his mortgage early. He gets all this stuff together and he's like, I'm about to pay off Stephan. I'm going to come up there and pay. So he goes to, to the bank of Stephan and he walks up. He's happy. You know, he's worked three years of just nonstop work. And he comes up to Stephan. He says, here you go, Stephan. Here's a check for all of the remainder of my mortgage. I did a great job. I did. And Stephan then says, oh, yeah, let me calculate this real quick. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Nobles, you still owe us a hundred thousand dollars. So they said, Yeah, you owe us a hundred thousand because you pay for that? because you prepaid your mortgage. You paid it off earlier than what you were supposed to. You don't allow that here. Oh, I'm sorry, you've already cashed. I'm sorry, you, you cannot take your money back. You've already processed it. So you need to owe us a hundred thousand. And by the way. Because you paid off your mortgage, this is due the next 30 days. So we need 100000 in the next 30 days. Well, Travis, I need 100000 25%. Per day. Per day. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So in that situation, it is, is yes. Prepayment penalties, basically the lender collects less money from the borrower when there's an early payoff. So if you, if Stefan has ended up, has you paying out in 30 days, well, guess what? So not 30 days, 30 years. He's probably lent money to me and to Travis thinking you're going to pay him out over 30 years. Oh, yeah. 
But if you pay it off earlier, you're gonna still pay that interest. No, so what happens? He ain't gonna get that money. Well, he ain't got the money to technically still fund mine and Travis's loan, so he's gotta make it one way, and how's he gonna do it? It's gonna penalize you, so he can still walk away with it. Well, I'm gonna pay that I'm running off. Yeah. So it requires that the borrower to pay a portion of the unearned interest. Okay. And the Texas law prohibits prepayment penalties now on residential homes that are going to end up having interest that is 12% or more. Okay. They are also prohibited on any FHA loans, VA loans, subprime loans, adjustable rate loans, and prepayment penalties are permitted though on commercial loans. Okay. Now the Dodd-Frank bill does limit prepayment penalties to 3% in year one, 2% in year two, and 1% in year three. Okay, so Dodd Frank did come into help in some of these so that they can't shoot you with crazy numbers. But if you borrowed $100,000, Mr. Eugene, 3% of $100,000 is what? What's that break down to? 3% of $100,000 is what? $3,000. Okay. Now, Mr. Grossman, you were talking about this one a minute ago. You, I asked you how many parties are in a mortgage, and you said what? Three. It's not a mortgage, it's a what? It's a deed of trust. There are three members. Now, Mr. Grossman, I want you to come up. Actually, no, I've been picking on Mr. Grossman. Mr. Uh, Stahl, you got a moment to come up here? I want you to kind of go through these real quick. Switch out for a second. Oh, yeah. So, with a deed of trust, you have a three party mortgage. So, you have the borrower, which the mortgager, which is basically the person receiving the money for the mortgage. Or, yes, receiving the money or that has to pay the money back. Let's put it that way. Make it a little easier. The lender, the one who is lending out the money, that is the mortgagee. And the third party is a trustee. And now the way this usually works is that uh, the borrower receives the, the, the seller will receive the payment from the borrower, but the third party, the trustee, actually is the one who holds the the, the title or the deed of the, of the mortgage. Now, the security for the note, that's again, that's this is helpful in that sense because it is on the third party or the trustee that has the security for it. Uh, let's see, file with the county clerk. Again, just more security in that sense. And then rights of, a, of the lender, any obligations of the borrower. So, and obligations of the borrower. So, that would be. Well, real quick, on the third party, on the, the trustee, who actually is going to be the trustee? Does the borrower get to choose that person? No, usually it's the lender. Why would the lender choose it? They're the one giving out the money. So exactly. they, they get to make the choices. It's their money, so they're going to make certain it's yeah. taken care of and they get taken care of in that situation. But it's normally the third party, the trustee is going to be an attorney that the lender that, yes. personally has a relationship with. Now, you're saying about the rights of the lender and obligations to, of the borrower, that basically is in the document, stipulates the terms, if you see what I'm yeah. saying. Okay. Does that make sense? And again, that is, Mr. Eugene, comes back to where it is going to be filed with the county clerk. Does that make sense? Any questions for Travis on that one? Nope. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Coming in. It's always a tight squeeze right through here. All right. So this kind of shows you that breakdown here. Of course, I give you a, I didn't give you the chart. You know, I had, oh, to, right. had, to, had to help you out and you know, keep that to myself yeah. here. So again, as you can see, the little breakdown of the, the deed of trust, you can see kind of the breakdown here in regards to the deed of trust. Uh, when the money is borrowed, the trust store, which is the borrower, is going to, of course, give the note to the lender, and the lender is going to give the loan to the trust store. But the, the borrower also is going to give a deed of trust to the trustee who just basically holds that what they call quote unquote naked title. Okay. Now, if the money is repaid, then the trust store will pay off the loan, 
then the trustee is the one that issues that release. And that's why it's normally an attorney that is the trustee because they're gonna be the ones that draft that release. In a mortgage, however, if you notice, there's only two parties, it's the borrower and the lender. So when the money is borrowed, the mortgagor, which is the borrower, is going to give a note and the mortgage. While with a mortgagee, they give the money. Once it is repaid, then the lender will issue what's called a satisfaction of mortgage, and that ends up releasing that one. Now, again, the deed of trust provisions, the borrower's obligations is, of course, to pay the note, pay the taxes, make certain that it stays insured, keep it in good repair, and also don't introduce any hazardous materials. Okay. Now, these are some of the key ones that you want to know about. Okay. There is a very key situation, and I tell people this all the time whenever they, they're thinking about selling their property or, or moving things around, there is a clause in a deed of trust called the acceleration clause. And the acceleration clause is basically it's the right for the lender to declare unpaid balance due and payable upon default. So what happened and the reason for this acceleration clause is, Mr. Eugene, if you borrowed money or you lent money, to Mr. Grossman to, for him to buy a house. Mr. Grossman's going to pay you how often? Monthly, right? Well, how effective would this be for you if Mr. Grossman doesn't pay you 30 days? So then you have to go sue in court to get you 30 days. And then the next month, he doesn't pay you. So you got to sue him again to get you your money. And he does pay the next month and you got to sue him again. You got to do this for 30 years. Is that efficient? Nope. No. Would it be efficient if we just say, if he doesn't pay in three months, then all of his debts do and you just file one time and you're done? Is that more efficient? Yeah. So that's what acceleration is. If a client fails or a borrower fails to pay within normally three months, sometimes longer, uh, then in that situation, it triggers this clause. And it means that if Mr. Grossman cannot pull his debt to be in current status, then Mr. Eugene can go in and sue one time, get the property and move along. Okay. Now the assignment of the deed of trust is when a note is sold, the deed of trust is then going to be assigned to the holder in due course. Okay. So it can be assigned out. The release of lien, like we already talked about, is where they release the deed or that lien and it basically conveys the ownership to the owner. Again, we all know what taxes and insurances are mm -hmm. and, and all new loans, when my father first got their house, did you have to pay your taxes and insurance on your own? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So what did you pay the lender back in the day? You just paid just what? The just, the just the principal and interest. Right, that's it. And if you need it you know, for the taxes and insurance, that's completely a separate thing. Oh, yeah. Now it's all put together in what's called an escrow account. Yeah. So when Mr. Eugene, you pay your mortgage on this house, yeah. what are you paying? I'm paying taxes, I'm paying for insurance, I'm paying for mortgage. And interest. And interest. So you're paying four things, and that's what we call PITI. Principal, interest, taxes, mortgage. Or, in, or principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Yep, yeah, that's correct. So in that situation, as you're playing for it, these basically appear. Taxes, insurance, homeowners dues, and mortgage insurance. Now, at the closing, the borrower is going to deposit the year-to-date unpaid taxes, two months tax reserves, and two months of insurance reserves. Why in the world, Stefan, would they want them to go in and pay two months up front of insurance and taxes? What happens to property values almost every year? They go down, right? Down, they go just, they keep going down. No way they do. They go, up. they go up. And so as Mr. Eugene's property goes up in value, what happens to his taxes? They go down, right? They sink, right? They go up. Why do you keep saying up, 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 up? That's where they go. Miss Leela told me that as your values go up, taxes go down. No? No. Miss Leela, you told me wrong. Um, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> Miss Leela's like, I wish it did that, right, Miss Leela? Right. <laughs> so, 
So in that situation, as your values go up, your taxes go up. And guess what? What is your also as your house goes up, Mr. Eugene, does your insurance go up? Okay, yeah. So what happens is, is they want to have this two months of reserves because they know within a year prices are going to go up. They need some money there. It's better to have it up front than to try to do what? Get it out of the client. Okay. Now with each payment, the borrower deposits one month's worth of taxes, insurance, HOA dues, and mortgages. Now understand, not all loans will include HOA dues. Not all. I've done many of them that don't. They only they only take principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. They don't deal with HOA. The HOA is independent of the loan. But can you still lose your property if you don't pay your HOA? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. There's also provisions within the deed of trust, which is called the buying that is subject to or buying on assumption. The property can be so subject to the deed of trust which means the purchaser is not liable to pay the debt in full. The purchaser also is not liable for any shortfall in the foreclosure sale, and the original borrower might still be liable for any shorts, uh, shortfall. So what this means is, is that I can end up, I can purchase the loan or purchase the house, but if it's not fully paid for, the original borrower may still be liable to pay for any shortfall, okay? When the property is sold on assumption, this is where the purchaser is liable to pay the debt in full. The purchaser is also liable for any shortfall in foreclosure sales, and the original borrower might still be liable for any remaining shortfall. So now we got two people on the hook. The alienation clause, okay, very key here. The alienation clause is what we call the due on sale clause is not or it is the note in deed of trust. And it's going to be stated within those two documents, and it states that the lender decides upon sale whether to call the balance due or an allow an assumption. So say, for example, I know we talked in another class, we had discussed that, say, Stefan is your son, Mr. Eugene. And he ends up, congratulations, by the way. Here's a cigar. Uh, and so, <laughs> so Stefan's your son. And Stefan has now gone over, you want to allow Stefan to have a life estate because you took Justin's classes. And you're like, they talk about life estate, and I don't want my son to have to go through insure or through a probate. So we're gonna do a life estate, and I'm gonna let Stefan have my property and I'm gonna keep a life estate. But what you didn't fully hear because you slept through most of the class was that if you have a mortgage, you can't do a life estate until it's paid off. So you owe Mr. Travis for that mortgage. So Mr. Travis currently has it filed that who's the owner of the property? You. You. But you go down to, say, for example, Mr. Aiden's, uh, Aiden's office, and he's a real estate broker, and Aiden drafts up a, a deed, a, a life estate matter, and he has you sign it and you go file it with the county and you basically now have transferred your interest in the property to Stephen. Travis, you like that? No, because who's the debt in? Whose name? He is. And if he has ownership, do you have any collateral? No. No, so guess what you just did, Mr. Eugene? You just triggered the alienation clause. Mr. Travis is going to say, where's my money? All of it. All of it. All of it. Because you did what, Mr. Eugene? You sold the property. You sold the property to Mr. Grossman, even though he's your son, you sold it without my consent. Thus, you have triggered the alienation clause. Where's my cash? Well, then that whole sale is voided. I'm taking the property back. That's why I tell people all the time. I actually had a person, a student one time, they tried to go look up online how to Google to do a life estate, and they were going to do their own paperwork and file it. I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh, -uh, uh, -uh. Nope. Don't you dare. Till that mortgage is paid in full, don't you dare. Because you do, you trigger this clause, and that screws everything up. Don't do it. Again, a deed of trust is secured assumption. It basically it protects a seller who agreed to sell on an assumption. 
The seller must pay the original lender if the buyer does not, and the seller demands payment from the buyer. And if it's not received, then the seller can foreclose under a power of sale clause. There also is a second mortgage. This is where there can be a lien that is inferior to the first lien. These are also referred to as a junior lien. And they represent the greater risk. So they usually have a lot higher interest rate. Now, second mortgages can be good in some situations and they can be bad in others. If you're going to pay it off very quickly, a second mortgage, you don't care about the interest rate. But if you're not going to pay it off quickly, guess what happens? You're going to end up paying in the long run. There also is a power of sale clause within the deed of trust, and it per permits what's called a non-judicial foreclosure. So rather than a court order and sell with a judicial process, you're just invoking the terms of the deed. If a deed of trust obligations are not met, you are in default on your note. They, of course, will accelerate that note. Then they will foreclose under the terms of the deed of trust. And that, of course, will then activate the power of sale clause, which then creates a out-of-court foreclosure. Now, if you are going to do the traditional route, which is called a judicial foreclosure. The process of a judicial foreclosure is that the lender's attorneys are going to file a lawsuit. They, of course, will obtain a judgment order that is going to be for the foreclosure of that lien. Now, the real estate will be sold at a public sale to the highest bidder. Okay? And it's used in Texas for home equity, reverse mortgages, homeowners association assessments, and vendors' liens on foreclosures. So all of these can allow for a property to be foreclosed on. This is what most people think when they think of not paying their stuff, that they got to go through the court system. But not always. There is what's called a non-judicial. In a non-judicial foreclosure process, if Mr. Nobles, Mr. Grossman defaults on two payments, then you would give Mr. Grossman what's called a demand letter or a demand notice, and you're going to give him the intent that you're going to accelerate the note. Mr. Grossman has exactly 20 days. If there are 30 on an FNMA or an FHLMC note in need of trust, but normally it's 20 days, to bring his current equitable right of redemption, you gotta get everything back up to normal, and the lender, if they do not get these remedies, the lender will request the trustee to act on those back payments if they are not made, which means they will force the sale, okay? Now, real, real quick before I move on, this one right here in regards to judicial can last sometimes for a couple of years. And it's not because of the fact is that the court system who wanna make it last that long, it's the fact of the matter is, is this, guess what? The court systems are backed up. They have other cases going on. They have other cases going on. You're just one of the cases that are at the back of the list. So in that particular situation, guess what? In a judicial hearing, Mr. Nobles, you could end up, if you did a judicial foreclosure, Mr. Stephan here could be in your property for four or five years before you get him out for free, for free. And while he's there, guess what he's doing? Tearing it up because he's about to lose. Okay. Under this process, look how quick it goes. We already said, we give him a notice, he has 20 days. Then at least 21 days before the sale, the trustee will post a notice. So he had 20 days. Now there's 21 days before the sale. We're still within a two month period. He posts a notice on the courthouse door or an electronic display. He also records that notice with the county clerk and notifies the borrower of the, by certified mail. If nothing still doesn't happen, the trustee holds the public cell at the nearby county courthouse between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on the first Tuesday of each month, no more than three hours after that sale. Okay. Look how quick that was. The trustee then sells to the highest cash bidder, same way as a foreclosure. The junior liens, any junior liens are wiped out, but superior liens are kept. 
which means, guess what? You get to keep whatever you buy, you get to keep the liens that go with it, so it transfers to you. After the sale, the trustee will give the trustee's deed to the buyer. There will be deductions of cost of the sale. They will pay the lender up to the balance. And then the, the borrower, so they'll pay the borrower any remaining funds or seek a deficiency judgment if it's not fully paid. There is no statutory right of redemption um, after a mortgage foreclosure, meaning that once it's done, it's done, okay? If the sale of the property does not cover the loan balance payoff, expenses of the sale are incurred in paid interest, then the lender is entitled to actually go get a personal judgment against the borrower for that unpaid debt, which means they can go after them, okay? Now, it must be sought within two years after the foreclosure, and it's often pursued to ensure the eligibility to recover the mortgage insurance proceeds. Now, again, foreclosure avoidance. Lenders, of course, are encouraged to work with borrowers to avoid foreclosures. They can, in some situations, do what's called a loan modification. Okay, so if happens, say, for example, Mr. Uh, Stephan lost his job, Mr. Eugene, and he can't find the work, he, he may ask you, can I work something out where I can still stay in my house, but you give me three to six months so I can find another job? Well, you could modify it, or you could forbear it. Forbearance is where you make up those missed payments later. Uh, and so they reduce the principal, but the balloon payment will be due upon the sale. Or, Mr. Nobles, you could just forgive it. You could end up writing off a portion of the debt, or you could recommend that there be mortgage refinance. The next one, now Mr. Grossman loves this one. This is his favorite one. Uh, Mr. Grossman, what's this say here, sir? Uh short sale. What, what's so good about short sale, Mr. Grossman? Uh, that takes forever. It, it's real quick? No, no, it's not. Extremely quick. This is short. Yeah, I know it says it's short, short, but it ain't. It's not short, right? So a short sale is definitely not short, okay? It is the lender accepts the balance due on the loan, and it generally requires, so they're not going to accept the full balance or taking less than what's owed. So a short sale, Mr. Eugene, is I come in to buy Mr. Grossman's property from him. He, you, he owes you 300. I come in at 275. I have to get your approval for the sale, which is $25,000 less. That's why it's short, you see what I'm saying? So it basically, it requires that the market value of the home is less than the loan amount. The mortgage is in or near default, and the seller has countered or encountered extenuating circumstances. The seller has no assets to pay the shorting difference either. Okay. Now the thing about this one, real quick, is Mr. Nobles, it's not quick because here's the process. Do you really want to lose that kind of money? No. And if he ain't got money to pay this, is he really going to pay you the difference? Nope. So most of the time, you might as well like to do what? Just foreclose on him. Just foreclose on Stephan, take the house, go sell it, or try to end up getting the house and sell it to somebody else. Okay? Now here's another option. This is called a deed in lieu to foreclosure. It's a very friendly foreclosure process. The borrower technically forfeits any equity in the business or in the house and the lender becomes responsible for any junior liens. So basically, the lender or the, the seller signs away their interest in the property. Okay, they sign away their interest in the property. Now, the mortgage forgiveness and debt cancellation. Now, it's not income with mortgage restructuring or short sale or deed in lieu of foreclosure or foreclosure of the principal residence basically income with debt forgiven on the second homes, rental properties, business property, credit cards, or car loans, okay? But one of the key things that you must remember is that foreclosure prevention counseling services are provided for free of charge by nonprofit housing counseling agencies, okay? There are services that are out there. 
but I will tell you, just keep this in the back of your mind. Actually, I'm not going to tell you because I want Stephan to come up here and tell you. Mr. Grossman, please come up here. Mm -hmm. Can you just We're say that? recording, sir. <laughs> yes. uh, in this situation, can you please end up telling them, do you recommend that they do short sales? No, I do not. And what advice do you give new agents that are about to become a real estate agent? Uh, make sure on you, short sales. On short sales? Yes. Uh, either avoid them or specialize in them. You don't know, have it, if you don't have experience in short sales, should you even get involved? No, you shouldn't. Okay. So I'm having him tell you that because he got lucky to be the very first newbie agent that got to deal with a short sale. And how did it go? Uh, it was not fun, that's for sure. And, he, and it ended in termination. And did you also lose a client? I did lose a client, yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you, sir. So in that particular situation, again, that kind of goes through and explains and tells you the process. Okay. All right. With that being done or being said, can you go ahead and uh, stop our recording for this evening?